Hi, I'm Ralph Preston, and here we are again. Hi, I'm Ralph Preston, and welcome to another Stroke Buddies Stroke Survivors Support Group meeting. We're doing this under Stroke Buddies, even though we've got um, other people from other groups, um, because sometimes no one wants to be the host, and I said, I'll be the host. But uh, it, this idea came from um, Mitch Raymond. If those of you who don't know Mitch, he's a, a stroke survivor, had a stroke at six years old and became a physical therapist and helps other people with stroke and other conditions. Hats off to Mitch. And uh, so Mitch, why don't you explain how this came up when we were talking? Uh, well, so as, as you know, 33 years ago, I had had the stroke uh, and I've also always had this feeling of being abnormal. Um, you know, even as a kid, I had uh, very few friends and I, and those friends I held close, but then um, as I went on, you know, to high school and uh, even into college, it, it was, it was very difficult to make and keep friends. And I just, I just kept my mind to my studies and stuff like that. And, you know, kept on throwing out a whole bunch of excuses and, you know, like, even to this day, my excuse is uh, being a parent. You know, I'm, I'm a busy career guy. I parent of two kids, and you know, uh, and and taking time off for myself to to develop friendships and and uh, stuff is difficult. But really, the core of the matter is not that. That's just an excuse. The core of the matter is uh, that feeling of abnormality. Um, I find it a lot easier to connect with my clients with disabilities uh, than to uh, other people uh, my age or around my age that are just quote unquote normal. Um, so I just wanted to have our community kind of um, uh, discuss this topic uh, and and I wanted to see if if there's some some similarities between my experience and yours, um, and I also wanted to just see if anyone had some wisdom or insight uh, into this this issue, and um, you know maybe uh, give out some tips to the rest of us on on how we can fulfill this obligation or not obligation, fulfill this need to be social within the human existence. We are not meant to be isolated. We are meant to be social, being meant to be connected, and uh, uh, that seem at least for me, that seems to be a, a, a difficult uh, avenue to explore. Um, so, I'm going to throw it back to Ralph. He's going to go ahead and discuss his his side of things, and then we'll open it up. Um, well, you know, I think that this is an issue for everyone in life, not just stroke survivors, because. I skipped a year of school, and so I was younger than everybody in my class, and that 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 made it difficult. Um, yeah, is it an excuse? Yeah, for sure it's an excuse. Did I hide behind it? Yeah. Why? Because I didn't exactly know how to fix it. Because, um, you know, who has those kind of skills at 15? In my case, I didn't have any sisters, so, you know, dating was really, phew. I knew nothing about women. I was younger than everybody in my class, so I didn't do a lot of dating in high school. Anyway, that said, I, I, I think it becomes more difficult if you have a stroke because of the, it's a problem for everybody, I think. And, um, but I think it becomes more difficult after you have a stroke because you have mobility issues, you sometimes can't get around as well, um, half your friends drop you, or you find out who, actually, you know, I, I had a, some friends not know how to deal with me and, and disappear. I also had a few that I really didn't expect that stepped up to the plate and we became better friends. So I think there's two sides to that coin. But in my own personal um, experience post-stroke, um, I would say, you know, having a group and being a coach and everything, Michelle will identify with all this, you know, we're kind of in the business of, and, and Lisa's a stroke coach as well. Um, not, thank goodness you didn't have a stroke, uh, Lisa, you yes. understand a lot about it for somebody who didn't have to go through it. And that's <laughs> a blessing. 
But, yeah. you know, we're kind of in the, I hesitate to use the word business, but we're promoting positivity, and positivity is a good thing. So I'm here to tell you that I'll continue till the day I die to promote positivity, but I'm not very good at taking my own advice in certain situations. Um, so uh, this is something that uh, I struggle with as well. What's the old saying? Do as I say, not as I do. Um, so something uh, th that I struggle with, solutions. Okay, well, I'll just toss a couple out. Now, uh, that would be a subject to get to after we go around um, with this aspect of it. And that is, um, I just, uh, I try and accept anything and everything. You know, there was a time where I'd say, well, I'm not going to go to that pig picking because I'm a vegetarian. And now I just go. Anybody invites me to anything, I just go. I don't try and overanalyze it or, 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 or talk myself out of it, basically what we're doing. Isn't that the whole thing about that Mitch was talking about, about it's an excuse. You know, you talk yourself out of it. I see both Jenny and Lisa nodding. So. Oh, yeah. I'm gonna. I'm gonna. I got more to say. I'll come back, but I'll. I'll. I'll, I'll let somebody else take. Take the hand. Abraham raising his hand. We'll get to Abraham. Jenny looks like she wants to go next. Mitch and I have talked a little bit private messaging. Mitch, I can say that I commend you, 100%. You've lived your entire life pretty much as a stroke survivor, so your life is normal. Take that word normal out of your vocabulary. What else do you know? You, you remind me of my son. Ralph reminds me of my son. Even though Ralph is older, he reminds me of my son. Your minds work differently than the average society. You're very intelligent. You're different than your next door neighbor. So that makes it a little harder to socialize. So what? Today, weird is cool. Today, smart is cool. And you said it yourself, it's an excuse. So for your particular instance, not all other stroke survivors, but for yours, Mitch, put yourself out there. Make a friend. Talk to the next person that you're standing next to. It, you'll make a friend. And it doesn't have to be the person who's disabled or your clients. Join something, make a hobby, and just join it. You can do it. Make time for yourself because then you can be a good dad, a good husband, a good friend, a good you. You can do it. You know how to do it. It's hard, but you can do it. I agree. I, there's no yeah. normal. There's no normal, and no, it's a relative term. You're you've gone to college. You're a physical therapist. You can do it. There, you know how to do it. It is what it is. One thing I'm inclined to do more post-stroke, and this is intentional, and the pandemic, and. Um, I, I talked to a counselor. I'm not afraid to say that. One of the things that's important to do, she uses the term building community. That's where I, when I started saying yes to everything. But another thing that I do is, and I, I don't go tapping people on the shoulder walking down the street or anything, but if, if I'm involved in the same office or same uh, space as somebody else, I'll often turn and talk to them. And that was like totally alien for me pre-stroke. Um, uh, the only time I did it was when I was commuting back and forth to Florida for six years. I'd do it in first class with my first class buddies. But other than that, I, I pretty much kept to myself. And I found that um, I've made some friends out of, out of those uh, relationships. In fact, I texted one today. I would never have talked to her. But I decided to talk to her. We found out we both love German cars. She had an 88 M5 BMW, so did I. I only made 1,500 of them. And we, at the end of the conversation, we both said, let's get together again. I mean, I met her in the airport in Miami. 
I'm, I'm in Ohio. I don't know any of these people around me. And I talk to everybody I pass, whether it's a hello. I sat in this lobby and just chatted with everybody. They may not be my friends in the future, but it's social hour. Yeah, Jenny, it's, it sounds like you're really good at being yourself. And that's something that I'm not good at. I'm good at being a physical therapist. I'm good at being a stroke survivor. Mm -hmm. I'm not good at being me, which is, it's that, I don't know if it's a guy thing more, uh, or if it girls uh, have this issue too, but it, it's do. like, I automatically, I'm, it's easy for me to jump into giving advice for analyzing and evaluating as a physical therapist, or to jump into uh, my experience as a stroke survivor, which just, when I go into that topic, I think it makes things awkward for everyone else. And That's it's like, why can't I just separate those two, put those two aspects of my personality into a box and just be me? It's hard. It is hard. They're part isn't that me? stuff part of you? I'm sorry, I didn't mean to over talk. No, isn't, that, isn't that stuff it is, part of who you are though? Right. It you is a I huge mean? it is a huge part of who I am, but I hide behind <laughs> Well, I got something to say here because Mitch, well, we're both guys and we both are involved. You with your family, me with my stroke work. You know, sometimes I feel like a one trick pony. I don't have anything else to talk about. That's another reason community is all, all the more important because, you know, if, if you want to build on social relationships, you need to have something more to talk about than stroke. And, you know, uh, that's. Uh, I've gone so far down that road. I've kind of let it uh, define me. So that's exactly you know, right. Don't let it define you. Right. Well, and Mitch Jenny, has so, voice. Go ahead. Mitch has his voice. Mitch, you're a physical therapist. You've gone to college. You have a family. So can you find it within yourself when you meet people? to discuss those things. And if your stroke is brought up, be proud of it. Why not? I am. I am yeah. But it's, it's, a, I think this is a, I'm going to segue into a topic that I think applies to the whole group here. I personally am really good at small talk. I can, I can talk about the weather. I can talk about politics. I can talk about, you know, all this, this superficial stuff. But part of what I want to be able to do is to be vulnerable and have the, the, the other party be vulnerable to me. And to get to that level, I have no clue. And Jenny or uh, uh, Angela or Lisa, anybody that has experience on how to go from the superficial mundane small talk to to actually getting people to open up and connect with them like how do you do that that's completely practice. foreign to me put in your time practice that's perfect that's practice is the perfect thing that you could ever even say to, the, to him another thing is getting to that authenticity with other people really requires you to get to that authenticity within yourself. Um, you have I really had to learn who I was and what I liked. And I dove into those things that brought me joy and that helped me grow and flourish in health through my healing from this oh entire experience you nailed it and girl i'm from ohio too we should connect <laughs> i'm in troy <laughs> are you in troy i'm up by cleveland <laughs> i love it i'm visiting with my husband he's in school right now it is a beautiful place i love it <laughs> well, jenny i was gonna say this earlier and michelle raised her hand so we'll go to michelle next um mitch i've read a lot of what Jenny has written, and this wasn't something she did on day one. She had to shed some of this stuff over a multi-year process yeah. uh, to find, she had to peel the onion, so to speak, to find herself. Yeah. 
I've mm-hmm. always been an extrovert, always. And I've always been social, but I had to grow and process a lot of traumas. And my stroke helped me process those unhealed traumas from my youth. And I had to do that with professional counseling, Mitch. So this, this knowing who I am was a process. So I think having a stroke as a, a young person like you, and then having a stroke, me at 26, is, to, is not totally different, but just a little bit different of a scenario. I had to go through a long journey mentally to well, figure out who I was. You also had a whole yeah. lot more life ahead of you than somebody like me who had a stroke at 58. You know, I mean, <clears throat> I wasn't done with life. I'm still not. But when you're 26, I guess you already had some kids. But, you know, you're <laughs> you're still planning uh, for the future a lot more than you are uh, later yeah. on. I can't fathom. We're all unique. We are all unique. Can't you know? fathom having one at six. So Michelle's had her hand up so long it's turning blue from black and <laughs> blue. I'm sorry. I no, can't no, see no. everybody. That's okay. I'm just being a wise ass moderator. <laughs> so go ahead, Michelle. You didn't do anything, Jenny. Oh, I can't. I was just going to say that, yeah, it does. It takes a lot of like personal development type stuff. And you really have to find out what you personally like and be okay with being yourself. And, and then you also have to remember that, I mean, I love how Jenny says hi to people when, when they walk by, because I, I do too. And I'm not an extrovert. I'm very much an introvert, but I will say hi to people. Um, but you also, when you do approach people, you have to remember that their insecurities about making friends friends and and approaching somebody or or your insecurities about doing something like that um are also their insecurities everyone feels this way and stroke no stroke that everyone feels this way it just adds a different layer to have a disability and i mean i had my stroke at 25 and so i literally was thinking life was over and so it, so I, Mitch, I can just imagine at six. Well, no, I really can't. I, it, that's just, it's just, um, you had so much life had you. And so that's a lot to deal with. And you, it sounds like you just dove into your work and probably chose physical therapy because you wanted to fix yourself as well as help other people. And, yes. um, <laughs> That's, I did the same thing. So, um, well, not physical therapy, but, um, but with OT and stuff like that. Um, but so that's, so that's really what I, I, what I wanted to say. I, I did a Google search about how to make friends as an adult. And I cannot tell you how many Reddit questions there were in the Google results for people asking the same thing. thing. So, it's it's everyone and you have and to everyone. ask questions acceptance as an issue coming back up uh, the, the the basic issue of accepting ourselves or the lack of acceptance yes. that we have thinking that stroke has somehow changed us or made us less than we used to be so maybe it's our old friend ex- acceptance, lack of acceptance, that also plays a role in all this. Um, I know, uh, Lisa. Yeah, I t- you know, listening to all this, I mean, I can relate to you, Mitch, in the sense that, you know, I'm a very much an introvert. And, you know, it being with people and socializing and all that, it is, it, it drains me more than it, it um, motivates me and excites me. And that's how I, what I consider an introvert, because at the end of the day, I'm exhausted. And I think just emotionally, but that's, you know, some of us are, are that way. 
And for me, I found that, and it sounds like you too, that the roles we play, it, it helps us interact with people because as a professional, we have a role. As a father, you have a role. As a husband, you have a role. But the thing to remember, and I have to do this for myself, is as a friend, I have a role. And what is that role? Um, and socially, you know, we have roles. So, you know, what does that look like to you? You know, if you want to be able to walk around and feel comfortable saying hi to people, you know, um, then that could be a goal for you. But I think that, you know, you know, part of it is acceptance, but I also think you have to figure out what what does what socially do you want that to look like for you? Um, because if you can't define it, if you don't know what it looks like, then you're not going to know what to do. Yeah. You know, so so I would kind of think of like people in your life. Um, what are those qualities, those social qualities about them that you like, and then just kind of work toward that because it is a goal building process. Uh, that's what it is for me anyway, and continues to be, um, you know, but I have to constantly work at it. It's not sure. natural for me. So that's can I can I just mention something? This, yeah. this is what's going through my mind right now. I think, I, this is my PT brain. I'm wondering what the frequency, what the dosing is for contacting someone and and staying in contact <laughs> to 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 get to that point of of having a relationship. And then there's part of me that's saying that you dope. That's not how it works. Like, <laughs> but I'm like. That's how my PT brain works. Frequency and dosing. It's like, it's not about that. And it's just like, oh, so frustrating. <laughs> well, one thing, one thing I thought I of agree. when Lisa was talking was um, the fact that I think we tend to, so what we all want is meaningful relationships, right? I mean, it's one thing to hold the door for somebody at the 7-Eleven and say, hi, have a great day and never see him again. It's another yeah. thing. What we all want is to sit down with other people and have meaningful conversation where the, we feel yeah. like they're having meaningful conversation with us and therefore we mean something to them because that's what we all want. Mm -hmm. And I think that one thing we forget is we look back at the meaningful relationships we've had in our lives and we forget that there was a whole process to get there. They didn't just happen. You know, you don't go to Walmart down the pasta aisle and pick up like meaningful relationships or new life partner. They're just, they're not there. You have to, you have to, I don't know I'm being silly. The, the things that take time that you have to build on. So. My very best friend, her and I did not like each other in the very beginning. Uh, we just didn't. And today we would, like stand in front of a bullet for each other so, so there's some easy. kind of process that went on there where you basically um forgave each other for being who you were in the beginning or you would have blown That's it right out of the water mean. from you know as soon as you realized you didn't like each other and there was some give and take probably on both sides to get where you are i her our husbands grew up together and their best friends her and i have Polar uh, opposite political beliefs, polar opposite, but we are like this today. It's always interesting when you get slapped together with somebody like that because yeah. of husbands. And, I'm and curious. Okay, go ahead. I, I'm curious what Polly has to say because she has her hand up. Oh, I'm sorry. Mitch, a lot of what you're saying resonates with me and... I will tell you something I discovered after the stroke, but kind of as a result of doing some work with a psychologist after the stroke is that I am on the autism spectrum. Ooh. And I look very analytically, like you were saying, at these relationships and maybe Part of that is your personality rather than, you know, anything. Maybe 
if you hadn't had the stroke, this whole thing about relationships and friendships would have been just as difficult. I agree. Mm -hmm. Yeah. He reminds me of my son and my son has not had a stroke and is on the spectrum. And he's a pharmacy technician, extremely intelligent, but you know what? He is so charming, uh, super friendly, but can only function for so long before he's exhausted and has to go hang out with his video games because he's had enough people. Um, I can guarantee see you right now that I have more insight than Sheldon Cooper from the Big Bang Theory. <laughs> <laughs> my, my son, everybody nicknamed him Sheldon because he has way more useless information than necessary. <laughs> but it, it is one of those things. You would never know because he's like me, extroverted, but introverted. Because he can only handle so much. Yeah. Where I'm the opposite, and you just let me go, and I just go, go, go. But my son's never stroke. So it is, it's not, I just don't think it's stroke exclusive, other than those who are isolated because of stroke. So, I'm an extrovert wannabe, but I'm awkward as a person. And to me, I like awkward because I think weird and awkward and silly is fun. I like everything. I think it's fun. Abraham, you had your hand up a, a long time ago. We had never let you speak. So if you... Um, I know I was just kind of waving at Angel Angelia when she came in. Oh, okay. <laughs> All right. No, I'm just I'm just listening. Yeah, I have I have a lot of trouble making friends and keeping friends also, but yeah. Well, I love you all. <laughs> well, this happened my this, I had a stroke um my senior year of high school and so um I guess how I was how I was social before was through sports and being active and doing all that and I don't I don't have that anymore so it's very very hard to I don't I guess I don't I don't know I just don't know how to be friends with people like I I used to have friends and hang out but now I mostly hang at home <laughs> Is it, I think oh. it's maybe something we do to ourselves because you used to know yeah, it how to could, do it. It could be. It I know how to do it in theory, but I'm awkward a lot of times. So, and too. a problem. I'm always telling you, Ralph, get out, go do something, go find something. And you're so fun. Like, you like fun things. I do. In fact, I just walked past the kitchen <clears> floor. <throat> And you were the first person I thought of. I really should have taken a picture of it. But you were the first person I thought of. There's a hippie store right downtown in this little cute town. And I thought of you. So Abraham, can I ask you a question? I don't know if he's, he may have left. Um, uh, he may have, uh, looks like he might have headed to the restroom or something. He'll be okay. back. All right. Um, go Lisa, ahead. I just wanted to tell you. When I joined the meeting, we were in Lexington, and now we're heading into Roanoke. We just oh. drove past you. Yes, I'll be darned. That's exciting. Virginia's beautiful. Yeah, well, we're going to go stay at a state park tonight and visit with my son who lives in Blacksburg. Oh, wonderful. Wonderful. Yes, not, you're not going to Claytor Lake, are you? Yes. <laughs> oh, that's fabulous. Well, I hope you have a great time. Thank you. So I have a couple of uh, other suggestions. I usually tell this to people who are sitting around trying to figure out what to do with themselves. and uh, But they apply to friendships. And one is um, 
I tell people to find something they're passionate about. It could be pre-stroke thing, like photography. Maybe you can't do it the same way that you used to, but if you're passionate about it, yeah, you can do things like join a photography club, expose yourself to stuff. Because, well, I think it's important. I, I don't understand people who aren't passionate about everything. You know, I figure if it's worth doing, it's worth being passionate about. So I... I, I I'm over the top, but that's another story. The other thing is, um, if you want to meet good people, volunteer. <coughs> volunteer. I, I know a couple of people who, uh, a couple of women who worked at um, rescue animal shelters, training dogs and that kind of thing. Well, I can't, can't do that anymore. So I say, go back to the shelter. It was something that you were passionate about. You know, go back. Oh, I can't run the dogs anymore. Well, they need somebody to answer the phone. They need some. There are all kinds of parts of, of their mission that you still can do. And I've never volunteered anywhere, never been on a Habitat job site or anything that I've been volunteering in where I didn't meet good people because good people don't come out and give their time. It's just mm -hmm. that's the way it works. So I think exposing ourselves to stuff like joining clubs or... Uh, um, Whatever there's a site uh, I know some people use Meetup where they have all kinds of clubs and groups. They got people who like cooking, so they have get together and cook at somebody's house or go out to dinner. So you know there there are ways. You know I I, I, I Mitch I know you're a lot like me, so I'm I'm already saying yeah Ralph sounds good, but you don't do that kind of thing. You know it feel <laughs> awkward and. I don't like showing up at uh, at some place where I don't know anybody. I'm I don't know about the rest of you, but I'm much more inclined to do something if I'm getting dragged along by somebody because then at least I know I got one person I can talk to. I, I don't have to sit in the corner and and and, and beat that guy. Um, so there we go again, giving advice that I'm not very good at taking myself. Uh, I have a I have a question for you all, and this is this stems from what Ralph was just saying. Going to like an event or going to uh, uh, some place like a, a hobby group or something like that. Do you folks think that asking for help, if it's something new and there's a whole bunch of experienced people around you, asking for help in what what it is that you're you're supposed to be doing at that event or that gathering can lead to some bonding between you and the person that's helping you absolutely yes. absolutely. Yes. absolutely absolutely people Our, like to teach other people especially when it's yes. something they're passionate about and they see that passion in you yep right you, One you, of the you things, allow them to be the hero if you will. one of the things i did I realized when I had my granddaughter, I wasn't going to be able to hold her and bond with her like, like a grandma should. I wasn't going to be able to feed her. I wasn't going to be able to do any of those things. I thought, okay, what's the one thing that made me so excited about one of my relatives? And it was my aunt. And it was because she wanted to know about me. She invested herself in me. She asked questions about me. I was the center of her attention whenever she was around me. I thought she was the greatest person in the entire world. So I kind of mimicked that behavior with my granddaughter. At this point, I am the favorite person in her whole world because I pay attention to her. I ask her things. That's what you need to do, Mitch. If you want that close bond, put yourself in their place ask them questions yes if you go to a group and you find somebody who's passionate about some ask them they're going to get very excited that you're interested too very good Rhonda. thank you very good and yeah so your relationship with your granddaughter is defined by that what we were talking about earlier that the fact that when we have meaningful conversation with somebody it means that they Care, we mean something to them and, and we care for them. So your relationship is not defined by your left arm and your left yeah. hand. It's defined by what you saw in your relationship with your aunt and, and trying to look at your life differently and 
have the relationship, I would say you have a better relationship because there are yes. plenty of people that can bounce kids on their knee that don't give them the time of day. Right. Um, so, yeah, very good answer. Kudos to you, too. <laughs> so yes, it's, it's the beneficiary. You and your granddaughter. Both of us. Yeah. Because she feels important. I feel important. It's a very meaningful relationship. So, so Mitch, Mitch, that's what I feel you need to do. You need to just ask questions of the other person. Get kind of into what they're doing. Because then they'll get in. An interested person is interesting. Right. So, so it's the same thing as meeting somebody, Mitch, and asking for help. You know, you allow that person to... Um, uh, provide you with the answer and that's meaningful to them or have just even if they don't feel like they have the total answer to have meaningful conversation with somebody that's what we're all looking for why do you think the group the experts are there at that meeting they're they're looking for newbies to help half of them it's no different than when you're being a physical therapist and you're helping your patients exactly. you feel good about that Lori, were you trying to say something, Lori Swain? No, I'm sorry. I was just listening. Okay. But thanks for asking. You're welcome. So, yeah, it's um, just, it's a matter of trying to, to connect on that level, to trying to um, not have all the answers. I, I, I'm really good at trying to have all the answers and really good at giving advice. And I think that's a bit of a turnoff. Um, and it's, I think it's more attractive for a potential friend to have them have that natural high of helping you. Yes. Is, am I wrong in that? No, not at all. Listen um, more. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Ask questions. I can't take. Listen. You know, listen more, talk less. Mm -hmm. I'm not very good at it. So basically, you have to find yourself, figure out who you are, and then move forward into getting out of your own head. And of course, when we say all this, we mean all of us, not any individual. Right. Here. Yeah. Can I say that it really starts with the way that you speak to yourself and the way that Ooh, you treat good. yourself? Yeah. And it really is something that, that you have to, like, listen, you don't have to do anything, but I definitely invite you to be a little bit more conscious and aware of the way that you're speaking to yourself inside of yourself. Yeah. And then then maybe start to be a little bit more aware of the way that you're trying to communicate who you are within your existence. If you want a friend, being a friend is the best way to gain a friend. Oh, and God. I just know that that's when I started in all of this, like a couple years ago, I started on the outside, just watching y'all, you know, and just kind of watching what people were saying and watching the different groups and seeing who was who and what was what and what people were going through and relating. But I certainly was a very different person a couple of years ago because I was still really lost in that anger and coming out of that, watching everybody else in their vulnerability has really led me to a friendship with my own vulnerability. And I have found some grace within that and developing this friendship with this person that I really didn't like before my stroke. I wasn't real happy and I wasn't in a good place, stress-wise, emotionally, spiritually, and today it's a very different spot, but all of that started with me kind of slowing down a little bit and really taking some time to hear the things I was saying to myself before I started trying to build any kind of friendship or relationship with anybody around me. Um, and that 
has been like the bonus of the work that I did in here, the work I did out here. You know what I mean? It's being able to have strong, solid communication with people is unbelievable. Yeah. And it welcomes people into your vulnerability. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yes. I mean, being, being vulnerable to yourself or, or, or yeah, that it, it, that's something that, you know, I, I have explored a little bit, but not enough. And, and, and it's very easy to just get lost in, you know, my daily tasks and can and i by point the end something the show, out though yeah you're being vulnerable through this meeting <laughs> and your vulnerability yes. is excuse my french but fucking awesome i'm so serious because it really helps people know who you are and i don't i don't know you i'm sorry i'm not trying to be rude but like i don't i've never met you before and um I feel very comfortable talking with you. I feel very confident that you are a very bright human being that went through a human experience. And that right there tells me that you've got something that I would love to see and learn about. I agree. Mm -hmm. yes. I agree. Yeah, I'm very and sincere. It, it usually gets to there with, with people. They want to know all about me and I'm really good at explaining that. But I think I get lost in that, and then then it's it's a matter of me being interested in them as well. Like mm -hmm. I I I have to not get all wrapped up in telling my story because I'm really good at telling my story because I've had 33 years of it. Right, um, but Mitch, try <laughs> asking a question. Ask them how do you feel about that? Have you ever experienced anything like that before? And I've that's something I've never done. Like I've never done that. I've right. never asked okay. them how they feel about it. They they just mm -hmm. I say that story and then there's like they're awestruck and then wow. there, it's just awkwardness wow. after I tell my story. And then it's almost like the story itself puts a barrier between me and the other person. So draw them in. Draw them in. Right. Draw them in. Ask them questions and draw them in. Have you ever thought about this? Have you ever tried this? Have you ever done anything like this? Have you ever been around anybody like this? Or experienced something similar, but not right. yourself. Get them to tell their story. Every human being in this world has had something. Some kind of adversity. Be interested in their story. Yeah. People, yeah. Want, people want to matter. They want you to, or they want to feel accepted. And I think that, you know, we feel that is when people show their interest in us by asking us questions. So I think the idea of questions is great. Yeah. Questions, yeah, and listening. Mm -hmm. um, everybody loves a good listener. They do. To tell their story. That's what we want in friendships. We want a two-way street. I mean, you know, it's not, it's it's actually more about listening and feeling like somebody's interested in us than it is having a forum to pontificate. Mm -hmm. <laughs> to me, that's, uh, that's what I'm, um, I'm looking for. And, you know, like I said earlier, these the things don't just happen when we look back on the meaningful relationships that we have had in our lives we tend to forget that there was a, a process that we went through to get there it didn't you know just uh, you don't go out on a date with somebody the first date and decide you're going to marry them well some people, some people <laughs> most, most of us most of us you know build on some good feelings that we have so getting those kind of good feelings going and uh, I, I think uh, Rhonda had some good ideas about um, you know turning the tables at, you know asking the questions being a good listener you know what do you think so I just told you a crazy story you know, you know what do you think have you experienced any what kind of adversity have you experienced in your life 
isn't it really about finding common ground? And as, mm -hmm. as human beings, common ground has to do with our feelings and emotions to me. You know, oh, I've also been through something. It wasn't a stroke, but, you know, whatever, whatever it was. Mm -hmm. um, when we find common ground, we feel connected to people. So that's one reason that, you know, sometimes things like volunteering and hobby groups and that kind of thing uh, can work because you've already got some kind of common thing. You ever thought about going to a um, convention of, uh, well, now you'd be all business. I would say go to a convention of uh, physical therapists. Okay. Yeah. Hmm? Well, the problem with socializing with physical therapists, fellow physical therapists, that they're all about physical therapy. They're all about evidence-based and studies and, and technical stuff. And it's not, there's no room to really <laughs> be, be connected on a social level. So I have at least that's my experience. Funny story. I'm a CPA. Drink. Try going to a convention of CPAs who are all introverts. No, I'll pass. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I don't like numbers. <laughs> On that note, guys, I do have to sign off. I'm going to head out for the night. Okay. All right, thanks, Jenny. Thanks for joining us, Jenny. Yeah, thanks for having Bye. me. I appreciate you all. Okay. Have fun. Whoa. So, Lisa, I wonder if there's a convention for extroverts. <laughs> you know, I'll just go to an extrovert convention and they'll do all the work for us. I'd be overwhelmed. <laughs> find a yeah. salesman convention. Me too. I'd probably find them annoying. <laughs> they are. <laughs> Just saying. <laughs> so, you know, this it comes back to we all have our issues as human beings, stroke or, or, or no stroke. So right. mm -hmm. um, maybe this isn't something that we should pin the stroke tail on the donkey um, yeah. uh, so much it's, and realize it's something that, you know, might be made more difficult by being a, having, being a stroke survivor, but it's something that we all struggle with mm -hmm. as uh, human beings. Definitely.